Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to be reading verses 14 through 17. It's part of a longer section where Paul is talking about a gift that he received from the Philippian church. But it's such valuable teaching that I wanted to break it into three different sermons. So the first sermon was uh, a number of weeks ago before we had some guest speakers. And then the next two will be the next two weeks. I'm very much looking forward to this passage. Some of the most poignant and concise teaching about giving uh, anywhere in the New Testament. So I'm very excited uh, to look into this passage this morning. And as we look at it, let's remember, let's recall that this is God's word. This is God writing to you. God writing to us. This is God's perspective, God's viewpoint, God's command. Let's enjoy it this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. I'm sure you've heard and used the phrase at some point in your life, it is my honor. Uh, we usually uh, preserve that phrase for some special privilege. We might say it's my pleasure for a Chick-fil-A employee, or it's my joy uh, for serving in some business. Uh, it's my uh, responsibility, we might say, if we don't particularly enjoy a job we have to do, it's my duty, it's kind of an English phrase. Uh, that I think should be resurrected. Um, but it's my honor we tend to hold on to for those very special privileges, those things that are especially important to us. For example, we, we use that word uh, when we talk about our man or maid of honor at our wedding. Uh, we choose someone that we, in a particular way, want to highlight their friendship or their relationship with us. We particularly want them to witness uh, our marriage vows. Uh, we might have a, an honor of meeting one of our heroes where we say it was an honor to meet that person because we looked up to them for so long. Uh, in the military, certain awards are given where a person has shown heroism or willingness to sacrifice for their cause, the highest of which is the Medal of Honor. Or in France, they have the Legion of Honor, which is to say you have joined an elite group of honored and recognized heroes in their country. For the Christian, there is a particular honor that God holds out to each and every one of us. There is a particular honor, there is a particular prestige that is not limited to the select few, but is offered to any. And as honor and sacrifice go, it's a relatively uh, simple award to receive. It is the honor of giving for the sake of the gospel mission. It is an honor that every Christian is intended by God to enjoy. When we get to heaven, it is God's intention that every Christian should have this badge of honor as part of their reward and celebration for the grace of God in their life. It is not God's intention that this badge of honor is limited to a few. It is a, an honor that he intends to see every Christian realize. It is the honor of giving for the sake of the gospel. So let me ask us a question this morning. Do we desire the honor of giving for the sake of the gospel? Do we desire that honor? Is it an ambition in our hearts to have the honor of giving faithfully for the sake of the gospel? That is Paul's overarching point in this passage. He is honoring the Philippians. And since this is God's word, God himself is honoring this church for their giving in support of the gospel mission. This is a very important topic, particularly in our country or in the West, 
because of the abundance of physical resources that God has blessed our society with. If you look throughout the scripture, it seems very clear that from God's perspective, to whom much is given, much will be expected. God uh, is not going to evaluate the number amount of my giving in comparison uh, to some impoverished individual in the Amazon rainforest, but he is going to evaluate the sacrificial amount. And whether I gave in a way that showed this is an honor for me to give for the cause of Christ, to give sacrificially, regularly, faithfully, that this showcases what I highly value and esteem. It, it's really held before us. If you look down at your, your Bibles, there in your laps, it is held before us as an invitation to desire the honor of giving for the cause of Jesus Christ. But this isn't honor for us. This is one of those things it should be easy to say yes to. One of those requests that would come to us that it is our privilege to do. When your best friend or your sister or your brother says to you, would you be the man of honor at my wedding? Usually you would say, it is my honor to do so. That's Paul's view of giving. Is it ours? Is it ours? That's the goal, I think, of this passage. Philippians ends with this celebration of the Philippian church giving. He wants to have us view giving in the right way, as an honor. Yes, a duty. Yes, a responsibility. Yes, a calling. But an honor, a, a privilege, something to celebrate, something to acclaim, something to be thrilled to receive that invitation. It is my honor to do this, Paul would say. It is their honor to have done this, Paul would say. We must say that as well. This passage breaks essentially into two sections, one longer and one shorter. Uh, the first, in, the, in terms of the, the marks of honor, the elements of this honor that Paul is celebrating, is sharing the burden of the gospel mission. My two points this morning are very simple. Sharing and giving. Sharing and giving. Sharing the burden of gospel mission. That's point number one. Sharing, sharing the burden of gospel mission for Paul is what makes this giving an honor. Notice verse 14. Paul says, it was kind of you to share my trouble. Paul has just said one of the most famous verses in the New Testament, that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. That's verse 13. He's made very clear, and he'll say again in the passage, he's at pains to say, that this is not about his personal benefit of the money. He's basically saying, look, I, I received money from you, and I want to celebrate that right now, but I don't want you to misunderstand. This is not because I need a particular lifestyle. Uh, the Lord Jesus has sustained me when I was impoverished and hungry and weak and sick and in the, in the sea for a night and a day and in prison. He has always been my joy. He has always been my comfort. Other times where I had an abundance, he was still my joy. He was still my comfort. He's at pains to say, look, this is not about my bank account as the, the apostle to the Gentiles. This doesn't matter if I have more or less food. I can trust God with whatever I have. What I'm celebrating here is not the amount of money that I have received but what it says about you that you have sent it so he says this is not about what I need per se but it was kind of you to share my trouble I want to zero in on that word share share notice if you have a little little footnote there in your Bible which you probably do like I have it says have fellowship in you see that at the bottom of your Bible probably to share my trouble very important word and if you look down a little bit further in uh, verse 15 it says no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only uh, those two words in the Greek are related to the Greek word koinonia uh, maybe you've heard that word before it's about fellowship it's about our participation in Christ it's a, a, a friendly partnership that God has created. And Paul uses a, a, that same root word twice in this passage, where he's saying, he's saying that you have shared in something. 
You have come with me as a partner in something. You have joined with me in a, in a mutuality in something. It was kind of you to share. And notice what it is that they were sharing by giving. They were sharing in his trouble. So Paul views this gift from the Philippians as a fellowship in the suffering required to advance the gospel. Paul is in, incarcerated right now, probably in Rome, and he sees the Philippians' gift as a way of shouldering that suffering for Christ with him. That they are partakers with him in his suffering. Very, very important concept. And you might remember, Paul said at the beginning of this book, chapter 1, verse 3, that he thanks God for them, for their partnership, same kind of word, in the gospel. For Paul, a Christian has been linked through Christ with the gospel mission. They have become partners in Christ. It's not as though in, in Paul's mind there are spectator Christians and professional Christians. No, every Christian is a partner Christian in the mission. That's what it means to be a Christian when it comes to the mission. You have become a partner. You are included in this missional partnership. And so Paul says, it was kind of you to share, to partner in my trouble. And then he goes on to elaborate on the type of partnership they have. He says in verse 15, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, that's when the gospel came to them, that's when it first transformed their hearts, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, that's partnership language, that's business partner language, except you only. So for Paul, the Philippian church has this very special place in his heart. He sees them as a church that was willing to bear alone the cost of this mission. Uh, you know, there's some types of giving that people would be willing to do if everybody else is doing it. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, that's true when, when you have little kids, and as long as everybody's working, then I'm okay to work. But if I see one sibling that is not doing their job, then I should not have to do my job either. And this individual is not sharing in the burden of this work, right? But as long as everybody's doing it, then I'm glad to play my part most of the time. Well, that's a different kind of giving than the giving that is born out of a gospel new birth in the heart of a Christian. A Christian doesn't give because they see everyone else giving. Now, everyone else should give on the basis that the gospel has transformed their heart as well. Everyone else should give. And yet, and yet, in this case, they were the only ones that were giving. Very, very important point. Am I, is this working now? Okay, a hand for Jonathan Raines. Well done, man. Excellent. Sometimes we need to realize that a privilege is still a privilege, even if we're doing it alone. Can't you feel the difference there? Can't you feel the difference? What, what, isn't it a little bit different when there's a sign-up sheet for snacks or meals or something, and you look down to see who signed up, and you're the only name? And doesn't your joy sometimes go down a little bit? Wow, that's disappointing. Nobody else signed up? Huh. Wonder why. And yet the Philippian church is willing to bear this partnership, this financial partnership, alone. It wouldn't matter apparently to them that others weren't participating. Actually, Paul, we think, uses their example to in some ways motivate and convict the Corinthian church for their failure to give. Paul points out that this church, which was relatively poor, was extremely generous, while the Corinthian church, which was relatively wealthy, was relatively stingy. He uses this church as an example elsewhere to say, look, you need to be aware of the example of the believers in Philippi and Macedonia, of the wealth of their generosity in the midst of their poverty, that they are not concerned about whether they're doing their fair share. They just want to make sure they are sharing in the burden. Their concern is not an equality of giving. Their concern is how much can we give? 
No church, Paul says, entered into partnership with me, fellowship with me, koinonia with me, in giving and receiving except you only. Paul seems to view the gospel as having this overwhelming connective power. We have received from Christ, we have received from the ministers of Christ, and we want to give, we want to provide, we want to support, we want to sacrifice. This is our responsibility, and more than that, it is our honor to share in the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our privilege, it is our, our duty, it is our honor. Sharing in the burden of the gospel mission. And not only are they willing to do it alone, notice what Paul, Paul also says. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So they're willing to share this burden alone. They're also willing to share this burden continually. Very important difference. How easy is it to give on one occasion? Or to give when you find an unexpected windfall or blessing or bonus? Is, isn't it simpler to give then? I, I, I have this money that I didn't expect to have, and so I'll give a portion of it because I still didn't expect to have the rest of it. I'll give a portion of it in a particular way. Much harder to give once and again. Paul seems to view them as having an ongoing burden to share in this cost of gospel ministry. They, they are not looking to merely kind of check the box that they did that at one point. No, they're looking to share the burden. They want this to be an ongoing responsibility. He says, even when I was in Thessalonica, I remember you sent me help for my needs once and again. And then we get the sense here that the Philippians were wanting to continue providing, but they didn't have anybody to send. And back then, you can't PayPal money to Paul. So you got to send an individual with a sack Right, And they didn't have anybody perhaps that they could do that with. Maybe they didn't know where he was. And so now finally they have an opportunity and they send it again. What does this reveal? A church that is, is eager, even, even desperate to share the burden of the gospel. For the Philippians to miss out on a chance to share in gospel giving was a great disappointment akin to that maid of honor missing her flight for the wedding. In her mind, this is terrible. You don't understand. You have to get me a flight there. My sister is getting married tomorrow. I want to be there. And it is not enough that I am there with her in spirit. I want to be there tomorrow. I want to stand with her. I want to support her physically. That's a Philippians view of money. It is not enough that I'm with Paul in spirit. It is not enough that I'm praying for him. It is not enough that he will have a welcome if he comes here. It's not enough that we would certainly show him hospitality. No, I want to be there represented by cash. I want to support him. I want to share the burden of gospel mission. They, they view this as this, this priceless treasure that's being carried around the world. And they want their hands, as it were, carrying that burden. They don't just want to clap for the other person carrying it all the way over there to Rome. Well done, Paul. No, no, I want my resources to be lifting that up as well. I want to share the burden of gospel mission. I want that badge. I want that honor. I want to be there, said the Philippian church. And Paul is commending them for all ages to all Christians, and more importantly, God is. And why do we think he is? As an example. It's precisely how Paul uses them with the Corinthian church elsewhere. He wants to use them as an example. Desire the honor of giving for the gospel mission. Do not be content with mere platitudes of support or even spiritual affirmation. Do not be content. Desire this particular badge of honor, this particular way of sacrificing. This is an honor for the Christian to be physically and financially supporting the cost of the gospel going forward. And as Paul says, it should not matter to any particular minister or missionary, person, church planter going around. It is not about their personal finances. 
This is one of the ways that the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel has undermined the teaching of Scripture is that many times you get the impression that the money used seems to support a particular lifestyle of a preacher rather than supporting the mission of the gospel. And yet the Bible is unashamedly proclaiming it is an honor for Christians to sacrifice and carry the load of gospel mission going forward. It was kind of you, Paul says, to share my burden. At first, no other church came into partnership like this in giving and receiving except you only. But then you continued to send for my needs once and again. Paul is commending and celebrating this church and he is inviting us to desire that honor as well god is inviting us to want to share the burden if necessary alone and certainly ongoingly is it not an honor to share the burden of the gospel of christ especially when we consider what that ministry is It is the ministry of the good news that Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The Philippians were aware what we're doing when we send this money is we are freeing Paul to preach the message that has saved us. The same message that created us in the beginning of the gospel. And I think Paul uses that phrase, in the beginning, intentionally to remind them of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the beginning of the gospel, he recreated these Philippian believers. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to believe the message of Christ. He opened the jailer's heart to believe the message of Christ. In the beginning, they were recreated as well. And one of the ways they were remade is to have a different view of money, a different view of honor. No longer is it honorable for the Philippians to merely have big houses and fancy clothing. Now it is an honor to give to the message of the Messiah. It is the message that God the Son became poor by taking on our humanity and living and dying as a substitute for sinners so that they could know the riches of heaven. To bear in our own small way the cost of that message is surely an honor to become poorer for the sake of making his name more richly known, is surely a privilege to give up some comforts, some opportunities, some financial security, for the sake of the one who died in our place so that others might come to know him and so the church might be built up, is surely an honor exceeding any other kind of honor we might receive. P.T. O'Brien says the gift was a sign that they had identified with him in his ministry and further evidence of their participation in the apostolic task of proclaiming the gospel. They are saying, I want my name on that mission. I am not content unless my name is on that mission. I will take nothing less. I do not want stuff more than having my name on that mission. I do not want bigger more than having my name on that mission. I do not want more more than having my name on that mission. I do not want nicer more than having my name on that mission. I do not want more frequent vacations. I don't want bigger and better more than having my name on that mission. I want my name on that mission. Nothing less will satisfy me. That's the Philippian church. That's the honor that God holds out to every Christian. Every Christian, the eternal gospel is being proclaimed. The one thing that is going to be celebrated when time ends, and we have the opportunity to share in the burden of its proclamation. Locally, extra locally, globally, we have that opportunity. From God's perspective, what is a better use of money than that? To share the burden of the gospel mission. Let's ask a question. Is giving to support the mission of the gospel an honor to you? What we do with our money reveals what we value and what is of value to us. 
To paraphrase Randy Alcorn, he says, what we do with our money is our spiritual autobiography. Is giving to support the mission of the gospel an honor to us? Do you give, first of all, uh, to support your local church, your local ministry of the gospel? If you're a member here, if you're from somewhere else, at your church. Is that something that is an honor for you? Is it, like the Philippians, something you are glad to do and glad to do consistently? Does your lifestyle uh, give place for regular giving, not just inconsistent, occasional giving? Is this an ongoing honor for you? Imagine if someone came to you and said, I'd like to ask you for a regular donation for the proliferation of daffodils around the world. I'm very excited about this. Perhaps you would consider giving generously to our cause. Daffodils are crucial in this globe. Would you please consider sacrificing to give on a regular basis? You can do it online. You can write a check. You can give us cash. We're looking to plant daffodils everywhere. Join us. Now, nobody joins a cause like that. Because daffodils don't need help. They're doing fine. And daffodils don't change anybody's soul. And if they do change your soul, come talk to me afterwards. They should not change your soul. That nobody needs a daffodil giving mission. But let's ask a question. With a room this size and a church our size, it's likely that this question could apply to some. Have you given about as much to daffodil proliferation as to the mission of the gospel? Be honest with yourself. In terms of your overall income over the course of your lifetime, if you were to compare those two causes, are they actually, from a percentage-wise, pretty close? I know not everybody does that. I don't know who gives here and who doesn't give, which is wonderful, and I love it that way. But probably there's some here that rarely or never give to the mission of the gospel going forward, even in their local church, let alone additional giving for missions that go around the world even for the ministry that they themselves depend on spiritually to grow. Brothers and sisters, we, we have to ask this question to be faithful to the text. Are, are you giving about as much to the gospel mission as you have to any number of other ridiculous causes like daffodil proliferation around the world? And if you are, isn't it true that if your money is your spiritual autobiography, and at some level it is, it is one way to evaluate the health of your values, then isn't it the case that the gospel in that sense is deemed as valuable as a worthless cause like that? If you were to evaluate value solely on the basis of your giving, wouldn't that be a comparative value? Such a thing must not be. Surely for the Christian, surely the Christian gives as a way of demonstrating the value of gospel proclamation. Surely our giving level should indicate the honor we consider it to give sacrificially for the gospel. Let me speak again just to those of you who rarely or, or never, this has not been a practice for you. Let me urge you, it's not, I can say with Paul, it's not that we seek the gift. I would much rather a church full of people, let's, let's say a single person who's going to college who makes $12 an hour and does not have a million dollar bank account. I'd much rather that that individual give sacrificially for the good of their own soul, even though it wouldn't change our bottom line that significantly, than a billionaire who gives in ways that cost him nothing and doesn't sacrifice and doesn't show any honor to the gospel because he doesn't miss it when it's gone. I want both to give in a way that for their own soul, it showcases the honor of the gospel. I would be much happier 
to find out that I have a, a bunch of poor people who give sacrificially of the little that they have than one rich person who gives without even thinking about it some superficial amount because that would say very little about his soul and very much about theirs. As Paul would say, we do not seek the gift. We seek the mark of that gift in the soul of the church to showcase the honor of the gospel going forward. Let me appeal to you, if I can, graciously and gently from God's word. Let God's word correct you. And he is gracious and kind. But if you never give for the sake of gospel mission, you must begin. You must begin. You must begin immediately. You must begin sacrificially. You must begin continuously. It, it is not obedience to spend your life receiving what God has given and giving none of it to the work of his gospel. It is his money after all. Let me urge you, do not go to heaven and find out that your badge of giving honor is the same amount that you gave to any number of other temporary superficial causes. Or worse, virtually nothing at all. Brothers and sisters, giving does not save us, but it is a mark of revealing our view of our salvation. Share the burden of gospel mission. Point number two, gaining the credit of gospel giving. Briefly, gaining the credit of gospel giving. Look down at your Bibles and notice this remarkable phrase. If, 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 it wasn't, if God hadn't written this, we would be embarrassed or fearful to write it. Not that I seek the gift. We know that. We know that's Paul's perspective. I don't care about the gift. I don't care about how much money we have. But I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Consider the miracle of this. Consider the miracle of that phrase. The, the word fruit there, uh, it may reference harvest. It may also be a sort of a financial term for interest. Uh, the idea here is very simple. As you give, you gain. As you give, you gain. You gain somehow a spiritual credit. Now, we don't know if this is spiritual blessings in this life or eternal reward. Paul doesn't specify. We can just take God at his word. As you give, you gain. The credit goes not only to those you are serving, but to you. And I think Paul has to also have in mind that every conversion brought about by Paul's ministry, every church built up, every believer edified at some level the credit of that from a human standpoint is traced back to those also who are supporting that mission. And before God, there is a credit to giving for the sake of the gospel. There is a spiritual credit to that. There is a gaining. It, it's, it's the irony of the way money works in the Bible. The more you give, the more you gain. Not financially, I'm not saying if you just give five, you get ten. I'm saying if you give five and five hundred and five thousand and five hundred thousand, whatever sacrifice represents to you, spiritually somehow there is a credit that God himself has says in his word is ascribed to those who give. Do you say, I mean, you'd be reluctant to write this if God hadn't written it himself. Paul says, I don't, I don't care about the money. I care about the fruit, the interest, the increase, the gain that increases to your credit. Paul has in view a, somehow a spiritual bank account that as you give, the amount goes up. As you give physical dollars, somehow spiritually there is a credit that increases. I don't know what that is and I wouldn't claim to know how it works. I just know it's true because God says it's true. Somehow as you give financially, there is an increase. There is a gain in God's economy. There is an, an increase in interest. So as you lose, you gain. Thus Jim Elliot could say, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And monetarily, this is that verse in the Bible. 
Give what you can't keep anyway, and you will gain what you cannot lose. We want to share. What, what is the honor of giving? Well, we share the gospel burden. That would be enough. That should be enough for ransom sinners to get to play any part in the proliferation of the message of Jesus Christ is an unspeakable honor. More honor than any sinner deserves to have. But the fact that God credits the giving of his own money to his own mission to our account is unspeakable generosity. It's, it's not our money. How many of you know that have had jobs out there how easy it is to lose them? Very easy. Very easy. You can do everything right and still lose your job. Right? How easy? It, it is God's money. God gives us the mentality. God gives us favor at work. God causes the economy to be such where we actually have a job. God allows our limbs to work if we do physical labor. God, God allows this. How many of us know there are more qualified people that could be doing your job that are out of work right now somewhere? I guarantee it. But somehow God has decided to give you money. And then he says, give. Share the burden of the gospel mission. And guess what? Guess who gets the credit for my money that I gave you to send the message that it should be your honor to give you do. Somehow God honors those with some kind of credit, blessing, affirmation for giving his own money to his own mission and he gives some of the glory that he deserves. He showers on those who have sacrificed. So let me encourage you. If you do faithfully and regularly give to support your local church, to support, I would encourage you to support Sovereign Grace churches. I encourage you, all this stuff that's happening costs money. And we give as a church, you can give individually. Uh, if, if you give faithfully, regularly to your church uh, elsewhere for the gospel mission, let me encourage you. There is fruit increasing to your credit based on God's word. I don't know how it works, but I trust God. There is fruit increasing to your credit. At the very least, you are being weaned from the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. And at the very most, you are being caused to love heaven more. And you are certainly being caused to be, be thrilled to see people brought up in Christ and converted in Christ, which is a greater joy than anything that money could buy anyway. Brothers and sisters, you are being given a credit for everything that you give. God has never misplaced any dollar that any saint has, any, has given. Look, listen, if you're, if you're seven years old and you get birthday money and you take some amount of that birthday money and you give to the work of the gospel, you know who counts that money? God does. If you're a single and you don't make very much money and you spend most of it on books for college, but you take a portion of your income and you give regularly to support the work of the gospel. And you know it's probably not making a big difference in the bank account. But for me, it is sacrifice. I'm given a regular sacrificial amount. I have to live differently because of how I give. If you're doing that, you know who has that money? God does. And if you are now proceeded in your career where you are making a significant amount of money or you have a significant amount of money, listen, the same number does not represent sacrifice for you. Sacrifice the same way that seven-year-old does. Sacrifice the same way. And you know who counts that money? God does. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. What are we doing here? We're just waiting for Jesus to come back. What else do we have to do than to give to his mission? Now, are other things fine and good, but I recommend that we all sell all of our houses and give up on cars and start walking. No, no. God gives material blessings for hospitality, and he's a gracious and kind God. But do I think probably all of us could reconsider what we are doing here is waiting for the return of the king and giving to his kingdom being proclaimed is our honor. That's what we'll say on that day. 
that's what we'll say. When our lives are recounted, when it is known and seen, what we have sacrificed, homes, vacations, cars, <laughs> wardrobe, I mean, what else is it, financial security, having to work longer because we couldn't retire earlier. What, what is it? What, what, what was that represent for you? When God says, well done, forgiving, you know what we will say? It is my honor. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the honor of giving. Lord, I pray for those that faithfully give. Lord Jesus, communicate your affirmation of them right now. Give them the joy, Lord, that comes in remembering that they have given to you. Lord, thank you that you're not a, a stingy master always demanding more and never encouraging for what has been given. Lord, thank you that this very passage communicates encouragement to those that have given faithfully, regularly, sacrificially. Lord, thank you. And please encourage those in our church who give, Lord. Encourage them. Communicate some of that spiritual blessing to them right now. Now, for those for whom this is a new teaching or not a conviction that they've known about or, or responded to, Lord, bring the joy of repentance and the joy of a different way of life and the joy of trusting you and the joy of this honor of giving to your kingdom. Lord, cause a change in their lifestyle. Cause a change in their way of thinking. Lord, bless conversations between marriages. Lord, bless parents talking to their children about this. Lord, bless this, and may there be spiritual fruit in our church as a result of this teaching from your word. Lord, give us the honor, and Lord, cause this to be true of us as a church, corporately, not just individually, but corporately, Lord. Cause our church to be a giving church that looks to support and send and sacrifice for those outside of our borders. Lord, cause us to be like the Philippian church that are, are glad to sacrifice, Lord, our money locally for what you are doing globally. Lord, give us the privilege of supporting church plants and, and Lord, leaders in other nations and, and those that are serving other churches in the way that Paul was. Lord, give us the opportunity to do that, Lord. And, and thank you for the many ways you have. Because we want the honor, Lord. Give us the honor of doing this, Lord Jesus, we pray. I thank you that the gospel made a new beginning in our hearts as well. In Jesus' name.